Uh, let's get to let's get to going to my session because we're running a little bit late. We have some wrap up at the end. I want to make sure we do with uh, Mahesh and uh, whoever's around. So uh, make sure you uh, do a comment, a code quality comp 22, and uh, we'll give away some software at the end. I know my my friend Mark is watching, so uh, maybe Mark will win uh, one of the software. Uh, I'm sure that's why he's watching. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to do my session. This session uh, called Rock Your Code. Uh, everything, every developer, .NET developer needs to know about disposable types. Well, everything I can shove into a, a presentation. Uh, this talk is actually based off of three articles I wrote last year. So if you go to .NETtips.com or C Sharp Corner, you can read those articles. Uh, so this is just a subset of what I wrote about uh, last year. But um, this is a, a very, very important subject um, that every developer needs to pay attention to because if you don't, you're going to cause problems. And uh, and I'll share some of that during um, my session. So if those are out there who don't know who I am by now, who I am by now, I'm David McCarter. I'm a Microsoft MV MVP and C Sharp Corner MVP, enterprise architect, consultant, patent inventor, host of Rock in the Code World. I'll talk about in a minute. So there's where you can... Uh, uh, contact me and you know because i write a lot about uh, code quality and it's one of my passions and that's why we have this conference is i've come up with a new title uh i haven't added to my slide yet and that's code quality czar you know uh i came up with this uh, when i was writing an article for c sharp corner and i think every team needs one and uh so uh since i'm looking for a new a position right now any team wants a code quality czar uh let me know uh, I'll come to your team and uh, whip that code into shape. Uh, just contact me. I, I want to, uh, speaking of code quality, there's also code performance, which is super important these days, especially if your code is in the cloud. Um, so I have a, a code performance book out there. Those are the chapters. Um, I'm continuously working on uh, these articles um, on my site. And I've been working on them for weeks now to update them uh, for .NET 6 and .NET 7. Um, that'll be coming out really soon, like in a couple of days. So I hope you pick up a copy of the book um, or go to my website. There's a whole section with most of this, the book on my website if you go there. And if you buy the book, 100% um, of the proceeds goes to the Voice of Slum, who we're trying to support during this conference, um, voiceofslum.org. Um, that I visited when I was in India in 2019. You know, they help uh, not only clothe and feed uh, children from the slums in Delhi, India, but they also uh, teach them and train uh, young women and things like that. So I ho hope you'll buy a copy of my book because all the money goes to them or just go to voiceofslum.org and donate directly. Also, speaking about code quality, um, I have the only pure .NET coding standards book out there. I hope you'll go get a copy of it uh, because every team needs one because you know we've been talking about this during the conferences. Most teams I go into don't have any standards the, at all, and uh, uh, let alone you know developers actually read them. So um, if you don't have any standards or you want to kick your standards in the in the butt, uh, please uh, get a copy of my book and 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 start your journey on uh, coding standards for .NET. I also want to plug my show, which is tomorrow, uh, Rockin' the Code World with Donna Dave. And my good friend from uh, Sweden is going to be on tomorrow, Magnus Martinson. I'm excited to uh, uh, chat with him again. And he will also be at the conference in Delhi, uh, the C-Sharp Corner uh, conference in Delhi in October. So uh, come join us there. It's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait to come back to India after uh, all these years. I haven't been able to go back because of dang COVID. So, all right. So here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, opening act is basically why I'm doing this session. Then we're going to talk a little bit about memory handling, uh, just to kind of get you on the same page, everybody on the same page. Then we're going to be talking about dispo disposing of disposable types, uh, properly implementing the iDisposable interface, and then using some tools that I use to uh, find issues. And then we're out of here and we'll give away rest of the software for the conference. All right. So make sure you ask questions. Um, I'll try to uh, answer them. I have um, some slides to stop and, and answer any questions during my talk. 
uh, as soon as the adult dating site gets off <laughs> our, our stuff. I'm sick of that. All right. So opening act. Why am I doing this session? Well, I'm, one of the main reasons I'm doing this session is my frustration on having to fix this on every contract I, I get hired for. I get I get sucked into fixing the memory issues because every project I get hired to work on has memory issues. And they they you don't need to have memory issues in .NET if you if you uh, pay attention and uh, and use tools to find issues. So one of the great things about .NET because you know I started coding before .NET came out is uh, you know if we're talking about other languages like C++ where you have to do a lot of work to handle the memory, and that's why we have a lot of memory issue, a lot of uh, hacking issues and things like that with um, uh, applications written with, with C++ is .NET kind of prevents all that from handling because .NET takes care of all the memory handling for you. But you need to be, this is why I'm doing the talk is you need to, uh, you still need, even though .NET handles the memory for you, you still need to know how to do it properly. So, so all types like uh, 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 time and integers and, and things like that are all created on memory stack. We're just going to talk briefly about that because that's not really uh, the focus of this talk. Um, all the objects that you create, you know, your person object, you know, uh, uh, bitmaps, and all those kind of things are created in the memory heap. And this is what we're going to be focusing on on this talk is the memory heap because this is what we need to uh, be worried about, not the stack. We don't need to worry about the stack. We need to worry about the heap. And .NET, you know, gets rid of the objects, as, you know, when they're no longer in use. And we'll talk a little bit about that, too, um, during this session. So the number one code issue I see when I go into co um, every contract I've worked on in the last 10 years, the number one issue I see is this. Developers not calling .dispose on disposable types, right? This is the number one issue I see uh, developers not doing right. And, and this is really unfortunate because if if you all just did this, I wouldn't have to be talking about this. And when I go to companies, I could just work on features because I don't like fixing this in your code. I don't, you know, uh, but because I've known .NET for over 20 years, I get roped into it because I know a lot more about memory handling than the normal uh, average developer. So. Um, this is the number one issue that I want to make sure when you get back to your project Monday morning or later today, you start analyzing your code for this because I believe me, you have issues. And um, and we'll talk about what this causes in the, in the slide coming up. And then, of course, something I see people not doing. This is not as much as, first, as the first one, but not properly implementing Dispose I disposable when you need to. And I've, you know, most every uh, a class I've looked at recently that implements I disposable, I disposable is doing it wrong. <laughs> so uh, that's why I came up with these articles in this talk. So what does this cause? This causes virtual memory leaks. So um, Donet doesn't have uh, true memory leaks like you do in C++, but we, what we have is virtual memory leaks. And what virtual memory leaks causes is it just starts eating up the memory in the user's machine or worse on your backend servers and just starts eating up the memory until your whole server stops. <laughs> this happens constantly during the day with many, many companies. And even I was doing some benchmarking recently and it, somehow I caused that problem and my whole machine stopped and I had to do control delete to get out of it. Um, so this is what you want to pre prevent because the first question I ask dev developer managers when I, I get hired at a company is I go, hey, this actually happened to me when I was working. Uh, this is a story uh, back when the first time I worked for Omnitrax, uh, the dev manager was named Dave and I said, Dave, after I analyzed their code and I saw all, you know, disposed issues all over their code, I, I asked Dave, so Dave, uh, 
Do you have any servers on your back end? You just have to reboot every once in a while and you don't understand why? He goes, yes. Every manager says this to me when I start working for their company. And the reason is because you guys aren't properly doing dispose on types that you're using. Uh, so uh, I know I'm on my soapbox. I'm going to be on my soapbox this whole session because you guys aren't doing this right. And I would, like I said, I want to make sure you start doing it right so I can work on features because <laughs> I don't like working on this. So this is a real world recent story because all my sessions are real world stuff. I don't show anything fake. And so I share real world stories. I'm not going to tell you the company because I'll get in trouble. Uh, but these stats I'm about to show you, unfortunately, are real. So in a recent contract I worked on, recent, I found over 600 places in, in their code that I dispose was not being called, right? And they had servers they had to reboot multiple times a day because of this, right? And uh, so over 600 places, I've never seen a code base so bad as this one, as far as memory management goes. They, they had, uh, um, oh, they had uh, over 90 types um, that they either implemented iDisposable improperly or didn't implement iDisposable at all, right? And in every every time, every type that they implement iDisposable, they did it wrong. <laughs> so I'm going to show you the right way, the one right way to do it uh, today. Uh, so stay tuned. What are they? Um, and what this caused was over 2,000 touch points in the code that I had to change. And believe me, doing these changes on this code base was a nightmare because, you know, just changing one type could cause hundreds of changes in the code, which caused hundreds of files I had to check in, which developers doing code review did not like. <laughs> they got angry at me, but I'm going, what can I do when you guys didn't do this right in the first place, right? So this is real. And and I worked, uh, this last time I worked on this contract, I worked about nine months and I was not even done fixing all these issues. So um, uh, you guys need to go <laughs> look at your code today or Monday and make sure you're not doing what I'm talking about in this session. I can't be any strong in my, my uh, 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 trying to make you uh, do this uh, for your projects. So let's briefly talk about memory handling. If you're newer to .NET, I kind of want to go through how the, the memory, uh, qu really quickly how it works in the memory stack. And the memory stack is where, you know, most everything you're going to be, all your types and things like that are going to be created. I'm sorry, the memory stack is is the one that you don't have to worry about. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so the memory stack um, is very fast to, to create um, types like date, time, integer, booleans. Um, all number types basically are created on the stack, including pointers that point to your objects uh, back on the heap. Um, so basically everything you really don't do a new on um, is created on the, on the stack. And the great thing about the stack is that um, as soon as you define that uh, variable, like a date, time variable, it's it's created in this in the memory stack, and as soon as um, the code block reaches the end of the code block, .NET automatically removes that um, a date time or an integer out of the memory stack, and it's cleaned up immediately. Um, so these types go in and out of memory very 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 fast, and it's one of the reasons .NET is fast because of, is because of this. Um, so we're not going to really talk about this because not there's not much you can really do. Uh, uh, because .NET takes care of the memory stack for you. Um, what we're going to be focusing on in this uh, talk is the memory heap. This is what we need to be worried about constantly when you're writing code. Whenever you're writing code, you need to be thinking about the memory heap. So for all objects, uh, basically, with new and strings, because you know, e even when you create a string, you don't have to do new in .NET because they kind of shortcut it for you. but um, but, but strings are part of this too. They are created on the heap. Every single string is created on the heap. 
Um, so if you think of all your objects, they're all on a heap. Um, objects are always created at the top of the heap. And I'll, I have an illustration to show you that in a minute. And that's why creating objects and even dot, uh, 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 reference types on the heap are very, very fast in .NET because they're always created at the top of the heap. And I'll show you that in a minute. And, and this is what we need to, to think about is they're removed by the garbage collector. So when you're done with one of these types, it doesn't get removed at the end of the code block. Um, it gets removed by the garbage collector at some point, And you really don't have a lot of control over this. Um, the garbage collector basically kicks in when it wants to. And, um, and there's a lot of rules that it, it uses, like uh, memory pressure and things like that. Uh, but you don't have a lot of control over what the garbage collector does. Um, so this is why we need to be mindful of how we uh, create and destroy um, objects in the heap is because of the garbage collector. And at the end of the uh, uh, this process, the garbage collector actually compacts the heap. So then the next objects are created at the top of the heap. So I have an illustration to show you that. So um, these are how objects are created in .NET on the memory heap. So each memory heap actually has three generations. And I'm not going to talk about the other two. So um, mo most, if not all, objects are always created initially on uh, in generation, what we call generation zero. And then if, uh, if .NET decides that it, that object might be uh, hanging around longer, it might move it to the generation one or the generation two, which is really for the long-term objects. Um, but we're really going to be focusing on generation zero today because um, this is how this is where things are created uh, most of the time in .NET. So this is an illustration of the generation zero. You can see object one, two, three, four uh, created in the heap. So when you create a new object, like a new string builder or a new string or uh, a bitmap or something like that, as, as soon as you do new, um, Microsoft news that object up and puts it at the very top of the heap. And that's why creating objects in .NET is super, super fast. Very, very, very fast because Every object is created on the top of the heap, like I just showed you, okay? But now let's talk about how they're destroyed. So um, here's an example of, I have a string builder. Um, it's, uh, this is some code I found in my open source project. And I have a string builder. And when I do new string builder, that creates a string builder. Here it's, I'm showing it in position two. Um, with a pointer, the pointer is actually on the memory stack um, because all pointers are a number, so they're kept on the stack. So uh, when you're using string, string Builder, you're really using the pointer to that object in memory, okay? Um, you're not really touching the object. You're touching the pointer that touches the object. So um, this is some code that I write bytes to string. This is from my open source project, Spartan. And so when it's created, it's created in the heap. And so it's living there as, as long as this code is running down, You do I do a for loop and I'm appending some stuff to it. And then I return to string. So as soon as it hits the, the end of the code block, right, then this object basically uh, can be removed out of memory. And so what .NET does is basically the object still is in the heap, right? But it removes the pointer basically in a nutshell. It removes the pointer uh, so you can't get to that object anymore. Um, but it's still there. So this is one thing I, I wanna make sure you guys really understand is even if your code block is over, your object is still living in memory, right? Uh, because you can't really destroy the object. The only thing that in .NET land that can destroy the object is the garbage collector, okay? And this is this is how the memory uh, works. So at some point, the garbage collector wakes up and goes, I've got to clean up some of these objects. And it looks at the pointer tree. And it's, it finds all the objects that don't have a pointer uh, to code anywhere. And what it does is then it removes that object out of memory. There's, there's, there's more things that happen, really, that I can't get into because of the timing. 
Uh, and there's also a different thing if you created a finalizer in your object too, which I don't have time to talk about. So basically it actually removes the, uh, at the garbage collector removes the object out of memory. So then what happens when you create another object, a string or a string builder or something like that, it's created on the top of the heap, right? It doesn't create it in position two uh, where the uh, uh, string builder was. It creates it on the top of the heap, always at the top of the heap. And that's why creating, ob you can spin up thousands of objects in milliseconds of .NET. It's, uh, it's very, very performant. It's one of the great things I love about that. .NET is just creating the objects is very, very quick. So then once .NET finds these objects and removes them basically out of memory, um, then what it will do, it will actually compact the heap. And so it will move the objects down that are still in use. And so you can see here, I have object one, three, four, five, six now. And, and then, sorry, I thought I had another illustration. So then when you create another object is created on, it'll be object seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So, this is how the memory heap works. Um, so I want to make sure you know when you do this, even if when you do dispose on an object, you're not disposing the object, right? The garbage collector disposes the object. And what I like to say in most of my conference talks is, is when it ever, whenever it freaking feels like. <laughs> like I said, you don't have a lot of control um, over uh, what the garbage collector does. And, and sometimes when I think about it, that's probably a good thing because... Uh, you know, the garbage collector was written by, uh, you know, developers a lot smarter than you and me. So, um, and that's a good thing. All right. So I, I did a brief overview of just how the memory management works in .NET. So we're all on the same page, hopefully. Um, I hope you got something out of that. Let me know if you did or didn't. I don't see a lot of comments except for the adult web, <laughs> the adult website on the feed. So. So now let's talk about the number one things that you guys aren't doing, and I'm pointing at you, uh, aren't doing when you're coding, and that's not properly disposing of disposable types, okay? So if you pay attention to this conference, please pay attention to the next couple minutes. So as software developers in .NET, um, we have to be mindful of any object that implements iDisposable, and I'll talk about in a minute how you find out if an object um, implements I disposable. Um, so it's critical. I can't, I can't say this strongly enough. It's critical to call dispose as soon as you don't need that object anymore, right? And I'm talking about even before the end of the code block, uh, as soon as you're done with the string reader, you should dispose of it because this will allow the garbage collector uh, to uh, remove it out of memory and compact the heap. So not at the end of the code block, you need to dispose of it as soon as possible, right? And I don't have time to get into what dispose really does because what dispose really does is, is dependent on the object that implements it, right? Sometimes it can get rid of files that are hanging around on the, on the system. Sometimes it can, can get rid of things out of memory. Sometimes it can release pointer uh, connections to databases or uh, um, connections to FTP, things like that. Um, every dispose method does something differently, right? That's implemented by whoever uh, wrote uh, that, uh, that type, right? But as developers, um, we need to make sure that we call dispose as soon as we're done, okay? Because this will allow the garbage collector to remove it out of memory. Uh, because we need to be mindful of memory. I know systems are getting bigger and bigger these days, but we have to be mindful of memory, especially if these systems are running in the cloud. It's very critically important if they're running in the cloud. Yeah, if you have any questions about the garbage collector, please feel free to put them in the, in the comments. I'm trying to read comments and talk at the same time. So how do you know if a type is an implement side disposable, right? Uh, there's three main ways I'm going to share how you can do that. Um, the first is um, you've used it before, right? So since I've been using .NET over 20 years, I have ingrained in my brain a lot of these types, right? Um, basically, you know, anything dealing with databases is is, uh, is one. Anything dealing with images or bitmaps, 
anything that ends in the word stream of implements are disposable. Every everything at .NET that it that ends in the word stream implements are disposable as far as I've I've been able to find. So because I've been using .NET uh, uh, longer than a lot of you out there, um, I have a lot of these types uh, built in, they're ingrained in my brain. So I immediately know it just by looking, right? Uh, but I still have to search and, and look around and, and search for things. Um, so that's the first way is you've done this before and you've learned the hard way usually. Um, the easiest way is is that when you're using when you're done using the type, just do dot dispose and see if it comes up in IntelliSense, right? And if it does, you need to dispose of it. Okay, uh, that's really the easiest way. Uh, is just try to do dot dispose, and if it's there, do it. If it's not, then it's not a disposable type. You don't need to worry about it. The other thing you can do, and this is really improved in the latest in Visual Studio 2022 is you can just right mouse click and say uh, preview definition. And right there, you can see the I enumerator uh, interface implements I disposable. So you know that anything that implements I enumerator also implements I disposable. So there's three ways. You have no excuse now. <laughs> I don't know if it implements I disposable. Well, now you have three ways. You have no excuse uh, to get out of this now. So those are the three ways. So uh, back before the using statement was uh, put into .NET, because you know in the beginning of .NET, we didn't have the using statement I'm about to show you. Uh, what we did basically is every uh, code block that we wrote that used the disposable type, we had to implement try finally, uh, because we had to use the finally uh, to get rid of the object of memory, because if an exception happened, then it will still get removed out. It will dispose will still be called because it's in the finally. So Microsoft basically shortcut that. I'll show you. I'll prove that to you in a second. Uh, Microsoft basically shortcut that and created the something called the using uh, a pattern. And this is the easiest way uh, to make sure your types are being disposed of at the end of a code block. And that's just by when you instantiate the type, you put it in a using statement like this. Okay. And if you try to put a type in a using statement that doesn't implement I disposable. Your code won't build. I sometimes I do this. I, I think usually when I'm playing around dispose with the types I create. But this is something from my open source project, uh, deserialize uh, XML uh, to an object. And you can see her string reader is one of those types um, to implement I disposable, and you need to be mindful of that. And so using the using statement, uh, when you instantiate it, uh, so what happens is as soon as it hits the end of the code block there, um, .NET will automatically call dispose uh, for you. You don't need to worry about calling dispose uh, when you use the using statement. And this happens, I'm going to prove it to you, this happens even if there's an exception in the code block, right? Because we need to protect because of exceptions, right? Because if you create a uh, iDisposable type in memory and it's not being disposed of in a try catch, a try finally, um, then when exception happens, it's just going to be left in memory. So uh, this is a big problem. So to prove to you what .NET is doing under the covers, this is basically, I think it's that method. And you can see there's a try right there. And you can see, and this is IL. There's a try. And you can see here in the finally, um, right down there, it's calling dispose for you. So using statement, all that is, it's creating a try finally for you. That's all it does. It, it just less code that we need to, to write these days. So um, make sure uh, you uh, use the using statement or try finally when using disposable objects. This is mandatory, people. You have to do this, or you're going to have servers that eat up all the memory. Okay. That's just the way it works. So um, in the same code base, I'm going to be talking about, you know, off and on during, the, you know, the uh, stats I showed you at the beginning of the um, um, session. Um, they were also doing this all over the place. And, and they were basically trying to put things in one line of code instead of a couple lines of code. 
And so what they were doing here is, uh, let me, so you can see that again. So what they were doing is they were newing up a string reader uh, in this um, um, serializer, deserialized method, right? Don't ever, ever do this, people. Never, right? Because dispose will never be called uh, when you do this, okay? Don't do this ever, right? Write one more line of code above this to create the string reader and in the using statement, uh, and that will take care of the issue. But don't write code like this. I'm seeing this more and more now because people want to shove as much stuff in one line of code as they can, uh, which is cool, uh, but it doesn't work for disposable types. You can't do this with disposable types. All right, any questions? Uh, Dynamic core dependency injection take care of? Uh, yes, uh, dependency, inject dependency injection does take care of, of uh, getting rid of these objects for you, depending on what kind of uh, uh, injection you're using. Um, you know, some of these things will live for the entire time your uh, project is running. Uh, but, uh, but yes, dependency inject injection does do that. How do we uh, know if we have to implement this post? That's the next section uh, I'm going to talk about. Okay, you're getting ahead of me. So I've answered the questions. Uh, uh, no more questions. Okay, great. Uh, I hope you guys are enjoying the uh, uh, session today. I, I just want to take a little break and take a little drink because uh, I've been all talking all morning and I'm tired already. All right. So I, I've talked about you need to call dispose on your object. So make sure you do that today in your code base. Go look for all these objects you're using in your code. You're not calling dispose, or you might that, or you might be doing it improperly, like I showed you in the last example. Okay, so I wanted to talk mostly about that section because this is the number the the pat the section I just showed is the number one thing you guys are doing wrong in your code. Okay, so now let's talk about if you need to implement the I disposable in the types that you create, right? Because all of us create types of .NET, you know. Uh, all kinds of types, right? Um, but how do you know, you know, if you need to implement iDisposable? Well, I'm going to show you. So if your type uses um, a disposable type in a field, you must implement iDisposable, okay? I don't have time to talk about when you're inheriting types that implement iDisposable and things like that. You go read my articles. Um, it's all talked about in there. Uh, but how do you, so if you have a disposable type, uh, like a stream reader um, in a field in your type, then you need to implement iDisposable, okay? Or if you have a, a bitmap or a stream or something like that, that's in a field, um, a private field, there better be a private field in your type, uh, you need to implement iDisposable, okay? So this is the problem. This is a real problem that I see in, in code bases, right? Here's a class called PDF Streamer. And this class properly implements a, a memory stream, news up in a memory stream, a private read-only memory stream, which is the correct way to do it, as a field in their type. And I removed all the other code because it won't fit on the slide. Uh, but if you're doing something like this, right, uh, you need to implement iDisposable. How do you know if, um, the types in your field, uh, imp you implement iDisposable? Well, I just showed you how to do that in the last section, okay? Uh, rewind and watch that, okay? Um, so if you're doing any disposable type as a field in your type, you have to implement iDisposable. You have to, right? Otherwise, you're going to run into the problems like this code base I've been talking about during my session, Okay where they, I bet you right now, they still have problems. Uh, they still have servers that need to reboot because uh, I left the company. Um, so you need to impl uh, implement iDisposable. This is the iDisposable interface. That's it. It just forces you to create a method called dispose, okay? And, and this is the method that the using statement uses, the garbage collector uh, can use and things like that is the dispose, dispose method, okay? So um, you need to implement iDisposable, which then will force you uh, to create the dispose method, okay? 
I'm going to show you. There's three steps, okay? And like I said, uh, uh, with this project I, I've been talking about, there were 90 types that didn't do this or didn't do this correctly in their in one solution. 90 types. I couldn't believe the numbers when I I came up with them. Okay, so. You need to implement iDisposable. Here's an example. You just add it. Um, you just add the iDisposable interface. That's step one is to uh, add the iDisposable interface, which will then force you to create the disposed method. But there's a method we need to create before we create that method, the most important method. Step two, create this. Dis there's two disposed methods we need to create. Okay, The first one is this one with a parameter uh, called disposing. OK, uh, and protected, I left protected there because if uh, if a type inherits this type and they, they then it can uh, basically circumvent the dispose and add their own stuff. But uh, mostly it will just be a private avoid dispose um, disposing like this. Right. So you do if to, if it's already if the object's already been disposed, then you return because you can't dispose of an object twice. OK. It doesn't work. It will cause an exception. So and then the next block, you need to do if disposing, do this uh, stream dot dispose. Okay, that's the way you do it. And then you set the dispose flag to true, so the object won't be disposed of twice because that will that will probably cause an exception if you do it. Okay. So this is the first dispose method uh, you need, you need to create. And this is the pattern you have to you you should be using uh, when you're uh, implementing dispose method. Is this one? This one takes care of disposing the actual objects. Okay, and as soon as that's hit, then that will basically tell the uh, garbage collector that object's not being used anymore, and the garbage collector can get rid of it. Okay, uh, but also when you call dispose, um, the object cleans up, it cleans itself up, whatever it's been doing. And um, and then the garbage collector can get rid of it. Okay. The second dispose method is the public dispose method that the uh, I disposable interface forces you to create. Create a public void dispose. The first method, a first a call in there should be calling the dispose method in step two. So dispose true. Okay. The second thing that should be in there, which I see a lot of developers miss when they're writing code like this, is GC dot suppress finalize this, meaning this object. Okay, GC represents the garbage collector. Okay, so what this does is it tells the garbage collector that the object has been disposed of, meaning it's get it's gotten rid of its resources. Okay, because if you don't do this, what will happen? is when the garbage collector wakes up and if your object has a finalizer in it, then what it will do is it actually won't remove it from memory. What it does is it puts it in a finalizer queue. It cleans up all the other objects. And then at the next run of the garbage collector, then your object will be disposed of. So that means your object will actually live a lot longer. Okay. So, uh, Maybe days, maybe hours or days it could live, right? And we don't want that. So as soon, you need to call suppress finalize because that will tell the garbage collector, I'm ready to get rid of, I'm ready to uh, be removed out of memory immediately. And uh, that'll make your apps much, much happier. Okay. So three steps implement iDisposable, create the dispose method that actually disposes the method, and then create this dispose method that calls that dispose method and suppresses the uh, a finalizer, okay? Three steps, easy to do, right? Um, at the end of the slide deck, I have a, a link to uh, 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 GitHub or Git or whatever they call those uh, one page things on GitHub to basically you can copy that and that's your pattern you need to use. And I use that pattern whenever I'm working on uh, types that I need to uh, implement I disposable, okay? So uh, because I like to try to make things easier uh, on myself and other developers, I've written a couple methods in my Spargin project uh, to help you uh, dispose of things, right? So uh, I created the method that instead of, if you have maybe five objects 
in in your type that need need to be disposed of. The problem is, you know, you might have disposed of those five types, right? Uh, but then if you have another developer come in that doesn't know as much as you do about dispose or maybe a junior developer or beginner developer, they might create something, a field that has a disposable type and not add it to the dispose method, right? So that could cause a problem too, right? So what I did was I created a method, an extension method called dispose fields that that's all you need to put in your dispose method and dispose fields will look at all your fields, find all the ones that implement iDisposable and call I call dispose for you, okay? First checks for null, of course, and then calls dispose for you. I call this future proofing, right? Some people don't like this word, but I love I love it. Because what this means is basically it covers the scenario I just talked to you about. Um, basically, if another developer comes in and, and puts a disposable type in a field, this will pick it up. You don't need to change anything. Magic. <laughs> so I get Spargin or, or rip off my code um, from Spargin and use dispose fields. This is what I use when I create types. Uh, something else I, I I saw in one of the contracts I worked on was this um, company, uh, and I don't recommend this for anybody, is this company was putting disposable objects in collections. So they weren't disposing these objects at all because they were in a collection. And sometimes these collections could reach up to thousands of, of items in the collection. They weren't calling dispose on any of them. <laughs> So that's that causes virtual memory leaks. And so I created another method uh, called dispose collection. It will run through the collection, find out if any of the types in your collection uh, implements are disposable and call dispose for you. Um, so the good thing is that if you, uh, sorry, I'm gonna go back, I'm trying to go back one. If you use dispose fields, dispose fields also calls dispose collection, okay? So you're covered. You just need to use dispose uh, of fields, but dispose collection is still there for you. And I created another one called try dispose for within your code block. Um, and it's just a shortcut to make sure the object is a null because one of the things I see a lot of people do is uh, they call dispose in an object, but how about if somehow that object wasn't newed up correctly and it's a null, then, you're, then it's gonna cause an exception and bring your uh, app down. So I just created this really shortcut uh, method called try dispose that works on any I disposable type, okay? So you're all covered. If you're not using these things, you should be. I use them in every project that I work on and it, it saves me from these memory issues, okay? So I'll put your questions in the chat. I don't see any new ones. Um, uh, just uh, thank you and awesome. Thank you everybody who's uh, watching. So let's go down to the next section, uh, which is, uh, so how do you find out, uh, you know, uh, where all these issues are, especially a person like me that comes into a new uh, uh, team? This is one of the first things I look for is their disposed problems because I know they have them. Um, I don't remember the last time I worked for a company that didn't have disposed problems. Um, so uh, if you're not .NET Dave, or you, if you don't, you know, worry about this all the time like I do, um, there's tons of tools. A lot of them have been mentioned uh, uh, during the conference today uh, that you can use to find these uh, issues. And I, I'm going to show you the tools that I use. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm going to say this at the end, but the best tool you have to finding this is you. You're the best tool. Uh, but these things can speed up. You can do it manually, which I don't suggest. Uh, I recommend uh, using tools. And I'm trying to give away one of these tools today. If, uh, if uh, somebody will do the, do the correct hashtag uh, in the chat today, uh, code quality comp 22 uh, to win code it right, which will find these things for you. So I just kind of said this, tools can dramatically speed up finding and fixing issues, right? If you're not using one of these tools, you really need to be, okay? So, um, so when I first created, when I first wrote these articles, and um, I was, and when I was working on this really bad project I've been talking about, 
I can't do this anymore, but I, I ran that project against all of these um, code analysis tools, right? To see if they picked up all the, because I found over 700 places where Dispose wasn't being called. And I wanted to see how the tools were doing. Well, as you can see, they didn't do very well. You know, Code It Right um, didn't find any, which um, I'm not sure why, because Code It Right should. Um, Code Rush, which is the refactoring tool that I use, didn't find any. Mark Miller, um, if you're watching, uh, which really makes me sad. They did find other violations, which I've listed there. You can see uh, Resharper found 101 violations, 101,000 violations in this tool. So Endepend, which is one of the tools I use, I'll talk about, um, found 72 issues out of seven, uh, 700. Uh, Resharper found three. <laughs> Not very good. I also try to program I don't use on a regular basis called Sonar Lint. Um, that found 25, but I found over 700 issues. Uh, so the tools um, have a lot of work to do ke to catch up on this. And I'm going to show you the tool that works the best at the very end, which um, I found after uh, I did this analysis. Okay. So let's talk about some of these tools. So like I said, I found 700 issues in this code base. Um, Endepend is a static code analysis, analysis and now, <laughs> sorry, analyzer. Uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about that during the conference. Um, and I use Endepend for uh, a code analysis because it finds a lot of stuff the Visual Studio doesn't or the Visual Studio analyzers and the editor config doesn't. Um, so I use that as like a you know a second pair of eyes on my code. I use Endepend, and Endepend has a ton of more features, many 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 features, uh, which are really great features that you need to use to find issues in your code. I also use End Endepend to create the. If you go to the Spargin project on GitHub, you'll see a nice graphic on how everything, all the objects talk to each other, and I use Endepend for that because I don't know any other tool that really does that other than Endepend. So. If you're not using Independent, I highly recommend uh, getting a copy and using it. It's not free. Uh, your company is going to have to pay for it. A sonar Lint, which I tried, um, again, is a Visual Studio extension identifies and helps you fix quality and security issues. Uh, but it found 25 out of 700. So if you're using sonar Lint, uh, you still need to use your eyes, I guess. What I found after I did this analysis on this project was this is what works the best uh, right now in, in .NET land, is the iDisposable Analyzer's NuGet package. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head who wrote this, or if it was Microsoft, I can't remember. But it analyzes your code for 20, 26 disposed issues, OK? Um, so uh, the one thing I want you all to do um, as soon as this uh, conference is over is add this to all your projects. I don't care. If you have disposable projects, uh, disposable objects or not, you probably do anyway. But you need to add this because this is the best tool I've been able to find um, to find the issues. Um, does it find all 700 issues? I highly doubt it. Uh, but as, as far as uh, 2022 goes, um, it's the best tool. And it's free. It's just a new good package. You don't have to get your company to uh, pay for it. So. It, uh, so make sure you add that to all your project. It works the best, okay? So I know you're probably going to <laughs> your project right now. Uh, I got a couple more slides and uh, then some software to give away, but this is the best thing to use. So you need to add it to all your projects. It's added to all the projects that, that I work on. That's the first thing I do when I go into a new project is add this uh, NuGet package because it will tell me uh, everything that's uh, 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 wrong in the project. Now I want to talk about one thing. I, I did a, a survey that's running right now. Um, I think I have a graphic about it, um, or I thought I would add it to this, is memory profiling. Um, I want to talk a little bit about memory prof profiling because I have yet to work for a company that does this unless I'm there, right? And I've even worked at companies that wouldn't pay me to do this. I kind of did it on my off time because they wouldn't, pay me to run uh, memory profiling on their code, which I, I don't understand, right? Because the one thing you need to do before the release of your project is to run a memory profiler against your uh, code running in uh, near to production 
uh, uh, environments, okay? If not exact copies. Um, this is the only way to find everything in your code because memory profiling will show that, okay? And I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna show you guys the tool that I use, uh, which is not very expensive and I swear by it. I love, I love it. Um, but I will warn you, do I have a, yeah, this, uh, when you run a memory profiler, I'll explain a little bit how it works if you've never used one, because based on my Twitter poll, most of you uh, either don't use one or you don't know what it is. Um, once you're done running the memory profiling session, um, it takes a lot of time to go through the report and find out where the issues are and to find out if the issue is, is your issue or if it's it's an issue in .NET or if it's an issue in a third party uh, uh, assembly you're using, right? I have found issues in .NET and I've, I've, I've taken those issues to the .NET team at Microsoft when I was there and had them work on it because I found it through this, okay? But the only way you're gonna find all of your problems is to run a memory profiler, okay? I can't state that strongly enough. And I don't understand why companies don't use this. I've, like I said, I've yet to work for a company that did this. And I just don't get it. Um, so yeah, I did a poll. So you can see here, basically 80% don't do it or don't know what it is. And so if you go to that link right now, you can vote um, on my poll because it's still going. It'll be going until next week. Uh, so this is an important subject. Um, and I'm available. Hire me. I'll profile your <laughs> code for you. So again, you need to run this against code that's running in environments that's near to production as you can possibly get it, right? Because, you know, all software works differently depending on the environment it's running in. And because it's because of the memory, it's because of the chip, the, the processor, there's lots of things that go into uh, how code will run, right? Um, so that's why you need to run it on something uh, that's near to production. You can run it on your local box. That will tell you some things, but that's not good enough. You have to run it in some other environment that's close to production, okay? And um, I, the tool that I recommend and use that's not very expensive, that works really, really well, and I like the best, is called the .NET Memory Profiler from SciTech Software. Okay, I think it's only a couple hundred bucks unless they've raised the price the last time I saw it. So what you do is you run your code and you attach the memory profiler to that code. So you never run this in production, okay? Because your production will, <laughs> the performance will go to almost nothing. Because <laughs> uh, this is very intensive and it, it really slows down your application. So you don't run it, <laughs> don't run it in production. Please don't. I run it in dev environments or a user accepted uh, testing environments or QA environments, okay? Um, and you run a, a side tech again, you attach it to the processes or processes, and you basically do a memory profiling session. And that session lasts as long as you want it to. You know, I've run sessions for hours before. Um, that'll create a huge file afterwards, but I, I've done it for hours um, to see where the issues were. And what this does is it, it basically detects everything that's going on in, your, in the memory in your pro in the, in your, your solution running in memory, right? It detects all the garbage collector events. It detects how much memory is being used in all the different heaps. How many objects are being created at any specific time? Tons and tons and tons of things, right? It's detecting, right? And one thing that I do towards the end, uh, the end when I'm using this, is there's a setting that actually will capture the values of the objects in memory. That's awesome because not only can you look at the report. You can actually drill in, I'll show you this in a second. You can drill into the object and you can actually drill into what the values of that object were uh, when uh, something happened, when something wasn't being removed out of memory. It's really, really helpful. Uh, but like I said, it takes time. So um, it takes time to run the memory profiler session and it takes even more time to analyze the report. And one thing I have to say, is you don't, every developer in your team doesn't need this, right? 
You don't have to buy a copy for everybody. You need to buy a copy for the people who understand how memory management works and, and will be running these profilings before you release your project. You know, I was I was working on a project once. I, I'm actually writing an article about right now, right now that the architect actually told me that we're going to work on performance problems after release. <laughs> uh, okay. So what the, that session, what you end up with after that session is over is this report, okay? And what this report, this report shows you all the memory issues, not only disposable issues, but other memory issues that, uh, that are uh, happening in your code, okay? Like the first one you see there is direct um, event handler roots are not being uh, removed correctly, right? But the one that, you know, I'm really talking about is the disposed instances, right? And then they actually list the objects that weren't being disposed. Um, and you need to drill in and find out um, why they weren't being disposed or if they even need to be disposed at that point in time uh, when you're running the memory profiler, okay? And there's lots of dispose um, uh, violations that it finds. This is just one. There's another one you, you can't really see uh, at the uh, bottom of that little uh, frame there. And it, it lists all the objects. You know, there's there's tons of things that this lists. It's it's a wealth of information, and it's it's a lot better than the uh, profiler in Visual Studio. Much, 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 much better. I don't even use the one in Visual Studio because it doesn't do near as much as. Uh, uh, a memory pro, .NET memory profiler does, okay? So this is the report I have to spend a lot of time on drilling in and seeing what objects that I can actually work on because uh, a lot of these things it's it's actually listing here are objects that I didn't, I didn't even create. .NET created it because of whatever was happening at the time. Um, so I don't have a lot of control over that unless my type was using those. Um, so this is the report you're going to use. And you can actually drill down to the actual object. You, at the very top there, you can see I, I show a graphics object as having an issue. And you can drill in. You can see all the, basically all the objects and how it got there. And so, like I said, it takes time. But you can drill into the actual object that was causing the problem and then investigate uh, what's going on. And so you can go back and fix it, OK? So that's a memory profiler. I know I spent a, a, a bit of time on that, but I can't stress enough. You have to be using a memory profiler before you put uh, your code out, especially on your servers, right? And like I said, if, if anybody actually does this, is watching right now, please make a comment because I've yet to find anybody who actually does this. And I, like I said, I just, I don't understand why. Uh, 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 teams and, and companies aren't using uh, products like this. I'm sure Microsoft does it, uh, hopefully, <laughs> Visual Studio team. Uh, but you guys need to start doing it, OK? All right, any questions? Nope. Uh, just a thank you. Thanks, everybody who's watching. So let's do the encore. Judas Priest, Woohoo! I saw this uh, concert. All right. So there's just a couple odds and ends I want to uh, bring up that didn't really fit into the other slides. Um, and we're almost done, and we'll give away the software. Mahesh will um, hopefully join me back, um, and we'll talk about, we'll wrap up this conference. So odds and ends. Avoid static fields. You want to avoid the static fields as much as you can in your code. I don't care what type of uh, 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 type you're creating. Static fields are a problem. Um, I can tell you stories uh, that I've, I've, I've had. Uh, I had this one company that called the company I was working for and because they needed help. They spent a month trying to figure out a problem they were having in their solution, their project, which they couldn't release to the public. It was an insurance company. And I found the problem in two hours, and that was they were using static fields. So avoid static fields as much as you can because it will cause all kinds of problems, but never put disposable types in static fields um, because they'll never be disposed of. They'll live for the entire time that code is running. So uh, avoid, just avoid static fields. They're not a good thing. Um, and like I've said a couple of times uh, during my session is you are the best tool to find these disposable issues. You know, I've talked about a lot of the tools 
that I use. Um, some of the other uh, speakers in the conference have talked about tools they use. Uh, but you are still the, the tool. You are still the best tool to find all these issues, okay? So this needs to be on top of your mind whenever you're coding, okay? And whenever, whenever you're uh, uh, looking at code, whenever you're doing a code review, this has to be number one top of your mind because this is how you bring down your apps. It's not doing this. And, uh, and Jerry's not here anymore, but you know, I would drill this into my C sharp beginners. The first class C sharp beginners took at the university. I would drill this into their head because I wanted to make sure that they understood it from the very first day that they were learning how to code in C sharp. Uh, so you're the best tool. Okay. Here, here are some uh, uh, resources. Of course, you can buy my coding standards book where I talk about this in detail. You can go to C Sharp Corner or .nettips.com where I've written three comprehensive articles about this subject you can go read, which if you go to the next uh, link, um, you can go to that first article and then read the other two, okay? If you wanna use Spargin uh, like I do in my projects to help you with your dispose um, code, uh, you can uh, go there and go to Spargin. You can uh, get the source or you can just use the NuGet package. I release a major release every quarter, which I just did at the beginning of this month. Okay. Um, I also mentioned um, the iDisposable template that I use when I work at companies. And you can go to that link there. And that's my iDisposable template that I put in every type um, that needs to implement iDisposable. Okay. You'll have to do a couple code changes, but other than that, there's not a lot you have to do. Okay. All right. All right. That's it.